Good evening. Uh, Good evening. I'm, my name is Jeff Delinke. I'm the president of the Eagle Historical Society. Uh, before we begin the program, this is our annual meeting, so we're going to have to call this meeting to order, and I'll give you a status report on the Eagle Historical Society in the past year. Uh, we have basically 250 member, active members. Uh, we publish a quarterly newsletter uh, and it's sent to all our members. We maintain an ongoing collection of donated artifacts. Uh, we communicate with the public or to the public through uh, Facebook and a website. We have our own website. And the Museum and Research Center is open to the public and we're open three days a week. Uh, the, probably the programs that we had last year Using our muse museum resources, we developed a program called Music, a Mirror of History. Uh, we presented this program in Eagle, Fort Atkinson, Whitewater, and Waukesha. Uh, the Eagle Elementary School for third and fourth grade graders had a field trip to the museum and the Veterans Memorial. <coughs> we hosted a sponsor, salute to our sponsors, with the uh, music of from Kettle Moraine Blues. Um, we also, in our Help Spread Our Wings um, campaign, raised funds for the expansion of the museum. Uh, thanks to our generous sponsors, the visit, uh, edition has been completed, and it's known as the Vernet Care Meeting Room. Um, we also participated in a picnic with the police and a ha uh, Halloween party. And just lately we entered, or entered in partnership with the North Prairie Pollinator Garden mm -hmm. Group. Uh, mainly, we're gonna have some programs and they're gonna help us plant, redo our gardens, I should say. Uh, e the EHS is a vital asset to the town of Eagle and the village of Eagle. And our mission statement is to collect and preserve human materials, material objects that are <coughs> illustrated of life, conditions, events, and the events and activities of the past and present of the history of the Eagle Town, Village, and Waukesha County and surrounding areas. Uh, I guess that's it. So now let's get on with our program. Thank you. Welcome to our presentation of In Their Own Words, a collection of remembrances from the archives of the Eagle Historical Society. We have attempted to paint a picture of Eagle, Wisconsin, drawn from the memoirs of those who brought our little village to life. My name is Gina Neist, and I'm your host for this evening. Before we begin tonight's program, I would like to thank the members of the team who conducted the research for this book. Our curator, Elaine Ladrowski, researched museum records looking for hidden gems and memorable stories that have shaped our community. We are grateful for the efforts of board member Janet Evans, who read through decades of EHS newsletters in search of articles that would grab the reader's attention. Photo archivist Carolyn Rosprim searched the files to find just the right pictures that accompany the essays. Newsletter editor Carrie Peavy provided expertise with the printing process. And special thanks go to Mike Rice, who maintains the EHS website, where many of these memories are made available to the public. This poem from the Museum Archives, written by Mrs. Alice Dixon, explains the reason we feel drawn to keep the stories of our ancestors alive in our hearts. I remember when. Today we are always wondering who were our folks and kin? How did they look and talk and act? And did they laugh and sing? What was it brought them to this place? Why did they settle here? What trials and hardships did they face? What dangers did they fear? We want to know about their church, the folks who worship there, their loves, their hates, their doubts, their fears, the burden of their prayers. Our granny told us all these things. She told them o'er and o'er. But we just turned a deaf and ear and thought, how she does bore. 
So now today we long to know the things we scoffed at then. We wish that we had listened to her. I remember when. <laughs> when we were adolescent kids and all of us at home, our grandmother lived with us so she wouldn't be alone. We loved our dear old grandmama and treated her quite well, but we were bored almost to death with the stories she would tell. We'd kick between the table legs, we'd sigh, we'd nudge, we'd grin when Granny bravely started out with her, I remember when. <laughs> she'd talk for most an hour or more. She'd scarcely stop for breath, but just go on and on and on till we were bored to death. But now that she has passed away and we are growing old, we wish that we had listened to the stories Granny told. With gratitude to all the members of the Eagle Historical Society for their efforts to preserve local history, we hope you enjoyed tonight's presentation of just a few of the stories from our anthology. The first chapter of our book is entitled, Friends and Neighbors, Past and Present. We've chosen three of our favorite stories to share with you tonight. You may have noticed the new addition to our museum. It has been named the Burnett Here Conference Room, thanks to a very generous donation of this woman who lived for many years in Eagle and Palmyra. The treasurer of the Eagle Historical Society, Pat Hawes, will share a remembrance from Burnett Here. Pat. I'm very pleased to read the uh, remembrances from Burnett. She wrote these herself in January of 2022. Eagle will always have a special place in my heart. Both of my grandparents, the Ammons and the McGills, lived in Eagle most of their lives. My dad and mom grew up in Eagle. They even lived close to each other. They fell in love, married, and moved to Palmyra. My dad had his barber shop in Palmyra for over 61 years. As a little girl, about five or six years old, I would pack my little suitcase my mom would put me on the train in Palmyra, and my grandma Ammon would pick me up in Eagle. The conductor always knew I was supposed to get off in Eagle. <coughs> grandma and I would go to the butcher shop, and I could pick out the meat we would have for dinner. Then off we'd go to Sherman's for the other groceries. Grandma would let me pick out a yard or so of any material that I liked. She always found time to make me a new sundress or a shirt while I was there. Before we left the store, Vinton Sherman always had a special treat for me. And not because we were sick, but we'd always stop over to see Dr. Schmidt and his wife. Just being good neighbors, I guess. I usually spent about four days with Grandpa and Grandma, and then my mom would come and pick me up. That was a big adventure for a little girl. Nearly every Sunday night, my dad and mom and I would have dinner at Sasso's. I always sat in the kitchen and watched Mom Sasso prepare our dinners. What a great Italian cook she was. How thankful I am at 92 years old to have all these wonderful memories of Eagle. <laughs> the Van Ruten and Kaw families have farmed land for, in Eagle for generations. Here to read her mother, Dorothy Kaw's story, is Jean Reese. And we're lucky enough to have my mom here herself. So. <laughs> Dorothy Kaw by Dorothy Kaw. This appeared in the spring of 2001. My father, John J. Von Ruden, and my mother, Captain Faisal Von Ruden, were married for only 10 years when my father passed away. Having three children to raise alone, she stayed on the family farm, along with her mother-in-law, doing the very best she could with hired help and good neighbors. Of course, as we grew up, we all had to pitch in and do our share. Much before age 16, I had to help with the chores and all the farming activities that go along with farming. It was much different from how things are done today. There weren't buttons to push when I first started out. The milking was done by hand, so it was one pull after the other. 
That chore had to be done before going off to school in the morning, but then we really got lucky and had an electric milker, which was quite a great improvement. Still having to strip or make sure the cow was all out and the cow completely dry. The milk was all out and the cow completely dry. Not like this day and age when the machine shuts off automatically when the milk supply stops coming. There were other jobs around that we all had to help with. Many farmers had a flock of chickens, so we had a good sized chicken house and a large flock of chickens. This meant helping with feeding, watering, and gathering the eggs. Trying to get the eggs out without that old hen pecking you was quite tricky and disgusting at times. Now, I can see her point of view, but the pail full of eggs was the payoff. There were always different jobs as the season changed. In the spring, there was getting the seed ready by using the fanning mill to clean the seeds so they'd be ready for planting. Then in the summer, it was trying to keep the weeds under control. I especially remember one cornfield that always had to be hoed by hand because there was an abundance of Canadian thistles that were in between the stalks and couldn't be reached with a cultivator. Besides, we had a neighbor, Joe Studi, who was weed commissioner and kept good watch on our obnoxious weeds, <laughs> namely Canadian thistles and oxide daisies which had to be cut or pulled so they wouldn't go to seed. Now you'll see them growing wild along the roadsides. That wasn't the worst. My mother being raised as a vegetable farmer always believed in planting a gigantic garden, or at least I thought so, when it came to hoeing, cultivating, and picking pickles. I had to lead this big workhorse on a one-row cultivator, guiding it through the narrow rows being sure to keep a close eye on those huge horses' hooves so it wouldn't step on my feet when we had to turn around on the ends. We had to make sure every inch of ground was worked. Needless to say, I was pretty happy at the end of the season when the plants got too big and we no longer could get through with the horse and the cultivator. Then it would be midsummer and the grain would be starting to ripen. We always hoped to get it cut while it's still standing good or before a storm would come and smash it down, which made it much harder to pick up with a grain binder. It also made better bundles so it would be easier to shock, which wasn't the most fun on a hot August day. The oat bundles weren't the worst, but they sure could make you itch. There was nothing like wheat or barley, which had the beards and were very prickly to work with. Then came the threshes. As kids, we really enjoyed seeing that old steam engine and threshing machine pull into the yard. I don't know about the men who had to do the work, but when I think about it, they always got a great meal. The women would always try to outdo the others, and the men seemed to enjoy having the meal together. I will never forget how my husband, who had run a threshing machine in his youth, finally remembered a special cake he was once served. He often talked of Mrs. Ostring and that dark red devil's food cake that she had served him on such an occasion. He never had one that was as good. Trying my darndest, I would come close. He would always say, my cakes were good, but they still were never quite as good as hers. With the grain being harvested, the next would be the corn. I never had to do very much of that because I would be in school. But I still remember how we would always have to pick up corn after the binder went through. Not like today, where they just leave it lay. Of course, the combine of today really doesn't leave much behind. You have to look pretty hard to find a cob. Maybe a stalk or so will be missed at the end of the field if the machine can't get to it. There still was a silo filling and shredding to do. They sometimes worked together with a neighbor or two or worked away at it alone. With the corn in, and if the ground wasn't frozen yet, they would start plowing with the horses and walking the plow. The tractor sure changed everything, and every year it would get bigger and bigger. Today, we don't even own a plow with a plowshare on it. They have a chisel plow, which is done right after the combine had gone through, and the land is ready to start the spring planting again. When the crops were in and the winter weather settled in, 
They would think about making wood for the winter to help out with buying coal. Of course, after the fuel oil came in, that sort of put an end to wood making. There were also the winter projects of preparing meat for the coming seasons. There would be the butchering of a couple of pigs and a beef. Every part of the animal was put to use, from the pig's snout to the tip of the tail. They used to say they used everything but the squeal. <laughs> we would make head cheese, liver, blood, potato, and summer sausage. We cured hams and bacon by smoking them in the smokehouse. We also fried and boiled the meat and put it in quart jars. When we finished, the basement shelves were filled until next summer. The poultry consisted of chickens, ducks, and geese, but were usually done in the fall so as not to have to house them over the winter, whereas the other meat was done in the colder weather because of refrigeration. Now with most of the work done for the old and new year, it was kind of a vacation time. There were always more chores to do in the winter. With the freezing weather, there was always some trouble, such as frozen pipes and more snow to shovel, as we didn't have snow plows. After the chores had been done, there may be a couple of relaxing hours or maybe a nap. Often my mother would catch up on her mending or clothes making if there was a need for a new dress or maybe a slip, a pair of sheets or a pillowcase. Of course, some were made out of feed sacks. In the evening, she would be cutting up odds and ends of material to make strips for crocheting rugs. I thought it looked like fun to do, so my grandpa whittled me a wooden crochet hook. That's how I got my start in crocheting. I have been doing it ever since, and I love it. It's a great pastime. In the summer, those leisure hours never seemed to come. You never would have a chance to slow down. You could always find something to do from sunrise to sunset. I did move off the farm for a year or so. I put in some time at Creston's Grocery. But when I got married, what do you know? I was just transplanted back to the farm. Ironically, about two miles as the crow flies from the house where I grew up. It was larger with more acres and more modern advancements. My husband, Alvin, and I purchased that farm from his father, Matt Koff, who had bought it from Sam Engel after an auction for a handshake and a dollar for a down payment. People were much more trustworthy in those days. We stayed at that same place for 50 years with many, many more changes and enlargements enjoying it all. But that's another story, enough for now. Dorothy Koff. Edward and Wealthy Miller named their farm in Eagle Friendly Acres. Their neighbor, Stephanie Kellness, wrote an article for our October newsletter in 2006 telling Wealthy's story. Here to read that piece is EHS board member Ellie Hall. Today, my brother Eric, my parents, and I got out and went next door for a tea party with Wealthy Miller with fresh cookies and ice cream. Wealthy is our soon-to-be 93-year-old neighbor. I love tea parties, especially with stages of another era. I glean a wealth of wisdom. Wealthy talked about growing up on the farm in Minnesota, where her dad forbid the four girls from attending high school. Girls didn't need an education. They were supposed to get married. What they need schooling for. And when they did get married, they got a dowry of a cow. Wealthy, having married Edward, a Wisconsin boy, not owning a farm, didn't get a cow. She got $1,000 instead. Maybe that's why they called her Wealthy. <laughs> Wealthy says that if she'd been allowed to go to high school, she could have landed an excellent job, job and made some money to help buy a farm sooner, like her four brothers had. Edward finished up at the eighth grade level as well, a common occurrence in the 1920s. In those days, you were allowed to teach any grade you completed, but if you were a woman, as soon as you got married, you had to quit. It appears that it was unseemly for wives and mothers to be working, for pay anyway. Wealthy was very proud of her mother, who had no fear, she said. She would see horse, loose horses with wagons 
screaming in tow, racing down the road, and she would run out and catch them for her neighbors. I asked her what her family's first car had been. She was seven, and it was a Model T. In 1920, there was only one choice of color. Even though old Henry Ford had said you could have any color you wanted, as long as it was black, <laughs> and basic black it was. <laughs> She was in a rollover accident in 1935, crushing her pelvis, and was told by doctors that she would be in a wheelchair when she got older. She's 92. How much older? <laughs> the only complaint she had is her knees, which undoubtedly took a beating from dairy farming for seven years, 70 years, 70 years. One wonders how heavy those old steel milk pails are when they are full. They certainly are heavy, Nancy. <coughs> they carried them two at a time up to the wagon and heave them on for a delivery to the dairy. They were the quintessential organic farmers. It sounds so very quaint now, but then it was the only way a good farmer farmed, using everything naturally, no waste. Her garden was the pride of evil, and Edward's fields were plowed and harvested with a team of horses, Lady and Beauty, which I still remember, even though I was younger than springtime. The horses also took us to sleigh rides and hay rides when we were little. <coughs> Their friendly farms photos were frequently found in state newspapers as being picturesque. Wisconsin, you can line them up from 1947 on and it's hard to tell which year is which. They have looked exactly the same since we moved here. They made butter and cottage cheese by hand and churned ice cream as a special winter treat. You needed ice from the lake. Practically everything came off the farm, which meant lots of growing, lots of canning, lots of chores. Flowers were her specialty, a small luxury afforded. The only items purchased from the store were flour, sugar, and salt. Homemade bread, pies, cakes, cookies. Every single meal had to be prepared from scratch, and we won't even get into what goes into having fresh meat. A political Helen, Arthur called her today. She loves calls, but not of this variety, and asked if her husband was there. He's over in the North Prairie Cemetery, she chirped, and hung up. I'm betting they don't call that. <laughs> Though not the youngest, Welby is the last of her family on Edward's side, too. Her mental acuity, physical fitness, and vibrant aptitude can undoubtedly be attributed to her dedication to her hard work and belief in her favorite Bible passage, Proverbs 16, 9. Men don't God lent. In German, the language she grew up and speak, still speaks. In English, it is, in his heart, man plans his course, but the Lord determines his step. And I remember wealthy garden very well and often still can picture her out in her flower garden. <laughs>